So let's head straight on, and we're going to go into a very different area now, heading headfirst into the world of Web 3.0. Confused? Don't worry. I'll explain. Sometimes tech speeds ahead of us, not only telling us what it thinks we desperately need now, but also forecasting what will be completely indispensable in a few years' time. There's always a fad around the corner, but I guess the question is, will it be sustainable? Think NFTs. So there are some that say that they're here to stay, that they're a vital part of fan engagement, get with the program or get left behind. But there are others who don't know what the letters stand for. It's non-fungible token, by the way. And B, they don't understand why you would want a non-fungible token. You can't touch it. You can't taste it. What's the point? So then we head into the world of the metaverse. Again, there are enthusiasts, there are evangelists for this other world. And then there are those who have a tough enough time trying to work out this world, let alone have some sort of representation in another. Crypto, obviously, is a very kind of debatable topic right now. It's an area which exploded with some fanfare a few years ago, but now has many areas of question and doubt, clearly economic, some even moral. Now, we have fascination in Europe over these things, and Africa is certainly not alone in, in being interested, fascinated, even at times obsessed with these fancy new terms and, and developments. But there is caution in the air for sport on this continent as it sort of slowly opens its arms to the next generation of the Internet of Things. What will Web 3.0 mean for you if you're a club, a league, a federation, a brand, or even a fan? Well, before you take that leap of faith, We've got some experts here that can guide us along the journey. So please welcome the CEO and founder at Zetley, Mike Glear, the CEO and founder at Capital Block, Tim Mangnall, and to guide us through the discussion on stage, the COO at Inkaku, Jason Anderson. Please welcome them on stage. Thank you very much indeed, Mike. Thank you, Tim. Thanks so much. Jason, I'm sure I'm going to learn a huge amount in this session. You're. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thanks, David. Um, sorry. Things got a little tight back there. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction. My name's Jason Anderson. I'm COO at Inaku. Um, in case I haven't already told you face to face. My company specializes in FIFA integrated player registration and competition management systems. Um, the MySafa platform we developed for South African football has registered more players and assigned more FIFA IDs than any other registration platform in Africa. And I'm obviously quite proud of that. Uh, globally, MySafa ranks 15th in the world <coughs> by this metric. Um, and fair warning, guys, I'm probably going to circle back to that topic a little bit later on. Um, but for now, I'm here with my distinguished panelists. Uh, to talk about Web3. I'm here with Michael Gleer um, at the end. Uh, Michael's hello, an entrepreneur with more than 20 years of experience <coughs> in sport management. He's the chief executive officer and founder of Zetly, um, an all-in-one sport fan engagement platform. Michael's also a world traveler, mountain climber, former basketball player, and referee. He brings more than 10 years of experience in this field we'll be discussing today. Um, he's educated as an economist and, a, and in sports management, and his life motto is, opportunities don't happen, we must create them, and I couldn't agree more. Tim to my right, Tim Magnell is um, <coughs> CEO and founder of Capital Block, one of Europe's leading <coughs> Web3 agencies and tech platforms dedicated to <coughs> sports and entertainment. Capital Block offers NFT strategies, crypto consultancy, and blockchain partner guidance as well as managing sports inventory and media for clubs in Europe, Middle East, North Africa, and Turkey. Tim currently advises a number of top European uh, teams and clubs, um, and Capital Block is the official Web3 agency of Galatasaray, AS Monaco, Trabzonspor, and Legia Warsaw. Um, thanks for coming here to, today to WFS, pleasure. guys. Um, it's been so a great much. pleasure already getting to know you. I've already learned so much, um, so let's get started. Um, we'll do a brief introduction and discussion of just on what is Web3, I guess, and I'll do my best to explain it in, in, uh, briefly in, in plain English. Uh, as the name implies, W3 is really just the continued, continually accelerating evolution of technology. It's hard to keep up with today, and I'm sorry to say that it's only going to get worse. For the most part, when we talk about Web3, at least in sports, we're referring to blockchain-enabled technologies and NFTs <coughs> at the top of the list. 
An, an NFT then, um, or a non-fungible token, describes a unique digital asset whose ownership is tracked on a blockchain. Think of something that is fungible as having common properties, something that is not unique, in other words. The coins and notes that we trade every day are fungible. Basically, one is exactly the same as any other, and uh, any other note or coin of the same denomination. Your 50 Rand note and my 50 Rand note are interchangeable. In other words, they are fungible. An NFT, on the other hand, is like a digital coin recorded on a blockchain that has, a unique, dig that has unique digital attributes uh, to it. NFTs are used to prove ownership of a digital asset, like a digital certificate of authenticity. And guys, feel free to jump in if I say no, anything no, no, wrong. You're doing well. But like anything that's traded and speculated, <laughs> NFTs are only worth as much as the next buyer is willing to pay for it. One of the best sports examples to date uh, is NBA's Top Shot NFTs. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because we have some friends from NBA here with us today at uh, WFS. Top Shots is a marketplace where fans can trade NFTs of NBA moments, and these moments are generally video clips that have been packaged and sold as NFTs. Um, not surprisingly, uh, the most expensive Top Shot sold to date, I believe, is one of LeBron James doing a dunk uh, that sold recently for $210,000. Our, also, our good friends at La Liga, who are also here, um, have a similar offering of iconic moments for the past 20 seasons, tradable as NFTs. So unique player cards of the top players in the world, like Messi, Ronaldo, Mbappe at the top of the list from So Rare, they also regularly sell for over um, $100,000. $100, so this leads me to my first question. The examples that I've given so far, and frank, you know, all of these cases that I can think of, quite frankly, are US or European-centric cases. Um, Tim, maybe start us off. Can you, can you start by putting this into a more African perspective? Uh, what are some of the challenges and opportunities you see for African football in the Web3 space? Sure. So I think we need to look at the Web3 space and the NFT space. We need to kind of take a step back and we need to look at what's happened in, in Europe, what's happened in, in America, and then see how we can kind of uh, relate this to African football. And I think the biggest problem, and this is a global problem, is there is a big misconception of NFTs and Web3 in the entire space, especially in the sports industry. And I think what people think about is they immediately think, when they think about NFTs, you think about a picture of a monkey or you think about a scam. And that is primarily the mainstream media narrative because everyone wants to hear that you've become a millionaire overnight from buying a monkey five years, two years ago when it was $200 or you hear about people getting scammed. No one really wants to hear about, we did a very good project, we sold 1,000 NFTs, and we made $100,000 from it, what have you. That, that doesn't really gain attention. And I think what there's a big focus on within the NFT and the Web3 space is there's a focus on revenue. And what you've got to look at is when NFTs came onto the scene and when uh, people were buying these projects, these first kind of original NFT projects, not even in a sports world, in just the NFT world, was a project called CryptoPunks and then Board Ape Yacht Club, which I'm sure a lot of people in this room have heard about. But the problem with those projects is those projects were created for a very kind of tech-savvy demographic. The people who were buying those in the original days were buying it because of the love of the blockchain technology. And then we obviously had COVID, you had a huge amount of liquidity coming into the market and you saw these prices go from $200 to $2 million or $500,000, whichever was, was the current market value. And what we then saw is we saw football clubs diving into this space and basically taking the same concept of what Board Ape Yacht Club did and try and put it towards a football audience. But there's two completely different audiences here. You're trying to sell a product to a very tech-savvy audience, or they were buying it for the love of the blockchain, and then the football clubs are trying to create an image or a logo or what have you, and they're trying to sell that on the basis that there's going to be a speculative asset and that that NFT is actually going to rise. Whereas what you need to look at from an NFT perspective and what clubs here in Africa and all around the world need to look at is we need to create products 
that are NFTs that are built on the blockchain that are not focused around revenue. They need to have a good use case, whether that be a digital ticket, whether that be a digital program, whether that be something that you own that unlock access to different bits of content, different bits of insight within the club. You need to focus on it from a fan engagement point of view, and then that will allow people to really understand uh, the opportunity within Web3 and with NFTs. So if you focus on that element and you forget the revenue element, revenue will come over time, but you need to look at this as a digital product. And I, and I say it a lot, and my personal belief is that we shouldn't be calling any of these things NFTs. Yes, it's a non-fungible token, but it's a bit like walking into, I don't know, an Apple store and picking, going, I would like to buy a physical product, also known as a phone. You would never do that. Cool. So let's talk about what it actually is. It's a digital ticket. It could be a digital memorabilia. It can be any of these things, and it's just a digital product. So I think the opportunity for clubs here in Africa is to really create this new digital products that are going to bring not only fans locally, but have the opportunity to really bring fans globally. And they then can partner with international kind of NFT brands, all of this type of stuff. There's a, a whole world of opportunities that people have to, that people are able to do within this space. But it has to be really built out for the long term. And I think the, the problem that most clubs here in Africa, and as I said, globally, are there's not enough education in the market. They don't fully understand it, and they don't also realize how much strategy and how much time it takes to start building out a long-term kind of vision for the NFT space. So I think there, there's a huge amount of opportunity globally, and I think Web3 is going to touch every aspect of our lives, especially from a sports perspective. Um, but the challenge is, is, is education, is, is building the right infrastructure, is making it accessible to people. And I'm, and I'm sure we'll go on to it. But if you're trying to sell an NFT with cryptocurrency and open up a MetaMask wallet and then a seed phrase, and I've probably lost some people in this room just by saying that. So we've really got to simplify it and just make it understandable and just start talking plain English to say, look, this is a digital product and let's sell it in the same way and let's look at what we know works from how you sell normal products. Yes, we have to change it a little bit, but a digital product shouldn't scare people. And, and also we need to kind of stop going, it's built on this blockchain and that blockchain and what have you, because ultimately your football fans don't actually care what blockchain it's built on. Um, so those are, I think, the, the first kind of challenges for, for clubs over here in Africa is, is an education piece and having the right people talk to them because there's a lot of nonsense in the market of people trying to sell things and this and that. And my belief of it is it needs to be brought very much in-house <coughs> and they, then clubs need to have the right education around it. Yeah, if I can just add you something, uh, the huge opportunity for the African sport industry is that we are at the very beginning. So none of them, they already create NFT, any, any kind of the digital assets so far. So if they will do it the right way, if they will take a, take a part, what we are recommend with team as agencies who, who create the fund engagement, if they will take the education part and they will be well prepared for the strategy, right? So they can build the utility. Like uh, Tim said, it's all about the utility behind it. Right. Most of the fan tokens who are right exist on the, on the market, we are talking about the socials platform and the fan tokens, they don't have actually the, the utility behind it. Right? So if you build the NFT gating and you will switch the names from the NFTs for a just regular, I mean a digital collectible or digital ticket, who can I mean, be represented with the sum of the utility, so this is the huge opportunity for the market because they can do the, the right thing starting from the beginning. I've always been saying that whenever you're building the house, you need to have a very strong basement and the fundaments. Mm -hmm. So this is a very good chance for them to build a good basement, start from the education, follow the strategy, start communication, and just warm up the community, the fans, so they will be able to get it uh, whenever they, they will be available for. So the good news is, at least in Africa, it's still a blank slate. Yeah, it's completely untouched market, so that's why uh, I will be happy together with, with team to, to have a footprint over there and uh, just to make a, maybe organize some kind of pilot program for a selected clubs or federation who will I mean, trust us, uh, our experience and knowledge, how we can 
how we can prepare the clubs for releasing any any kind of digital collect collectibles or build the fan engagement based on this in the future. So, mm. so yeah, it's a, right now it's completely untouched market, but I see there is a huge opportunity since almost I don't know 150 major uh, major world. I would say clubs already released the digital assets, right? So I think there is, there is a right time to explore the, explore the web free, start learning. The education takes time, right? So education of the fans, so they will be fully understand and, you know, so there's, there is a right time for it. But you have to create the, the secondary market. Without the secondary market of conscious users, and the, the conscious users of the fans, so this is the biggest value of the club's defense. So without having such a market, it's completely nonsense to do this. Hmm. Even the Liverpool presented, right? They released the NFTs collections without the proper education of the clubs, and they just sold it 20% of it. Because most of the Liverpool fans even didn't have an idea how to, I mean, uh, just to get it, you know, how to, how to get uh, and put it on their wallets. When, and when clubs come to you now, uh, Tim, maybe you can start. When clubs come to you now, what are the questions that they're asking? Are, they, are the clubs actually part of that uh, sort of get-rich-quick craze? Are they, are they wanting to cash in immediately, or are, they, or are they looking at it more from a fan engagement perspective? It, if you'd asked the question six months ago, a year ago, it would be they want to get rich quickly. Hmm. Um, definitely a year ago, the first question that we would walk oh. into any of the clubs that we represent uh, would be, how much percentage do we get on the secondary market? That, that was the first question, how much money are we gonna make from this? And I think actually, you look at, from a club perspective, there isn't a secondary market anywhere in the world. And when you say secondary market, you mean resale of these tokens? Resale of it, so obviously you sell it. Yeah, on you the have to create it, yeah. Yeah, you sell it on the primary market, which will be the initial kind of sale, and then there needs to be a secondary market. But that goes back to my original point of why are we immediately focusing on revenue? Like how much are we gonna sell it for? How much are you gonna sell it for? If I go back to the phone analogy again, you don't walk into Apple and buy an iPhone and then the next day put it up on eBay and go, I bought this for $900 and I wanna sell it for $1,500. The world doesn't work like that, and NFTs are no different to a digital product. So the clubs a year ago, yes, were asking very much around revenue, secondary market, how are we going to do that? Then given everything that's, that happens in the crypto space after the last year, the, the downtrend bear market that we're in, they've and also seeing a lot of clubs do some very, very bad projects, they've become a little bit more cautious in their approach um, and there is a lot more of an education piece that that needs to be done so they really want to understand it but the problem that you still have and and I understand it a football club is still a business and it still needs to drive revenue and the NFT world sits in the partnership world now my belief is that it shouldn't sit anywhere near the partnership world it should sit in the innovation department and the reason for that is if you go in as a sponsorship to a club. So let's say you're platform one, two, three, and you are looking to sell some NFTs, or you want some IP from that football club. Let's take a mid-tier football club in, in Germany that's got a million fans. They're minimum probably gonna ask for about half a million for a sponsorship deal, which means you've got a million, a fan base of a million people that you're gonna try and sell some NFTs to. But out of that million fans, I guarantee you a thousand people probably will buy an NFT, maximum. So immediately you're cutting your opportunity to sell to a thousand people and you've just invested half a million dollars into this club. So you're then gonna have to think, okay, how am I gonna start driving revenue? And that means you're gonna have to start selling either a thousand NFTs at $500, and that's just not including marketing, company cost, running cost, blah, blah, blah. Or you drop the cost to $100, let's say, which is maybe more affordable for your average European football fan, but then you've got to find an extra 4,000 people out of the million people to buy NFTs and come onto your platform and do things like that. So there is a, a real problem with clubs looking at, it, looking at it again from a revenue perspective because when that company ultimately fails, which it will, because we've seen it time and time again, companies like Sporting Mon Go, all over the market that have been failing because they've been putting huge sponsorship deals and they then can't keep up with the payments and, and they're not driving revenue. When they focus on that, you're then gonna leave a bad taste in your mouth. So we work very closely with the clubs to obviously bring in 
uh, an understanding of you need to bring this in the house. You need to ask the question, why? Why are you doing this? Like, and if you're focusing on revenue, we as a business, we won't touch you. And as I said, we, we drive revenue. We've made very, very good revenue for our clubs, but over a long period of time. Um, and we work with some of our clubs for a year before we even launch anything. So I think the clubs are starting to understand that. But also, fundamentally, do you actually believe in an NFT? You look at some of the the um, uh, board directors and owners of football clubs across Europe, maybe of an older generation that don't necessarily believe in cryptocurrencies or NFTs or Web3. So if you fundamentally don't believe it from the top, it's not going to kind of seep down into the club. So there needs to be a real shift in perception. And that is coming, but people still don't fully understand the power of what an NFT can create and actually what the blockchain can do. Um, and again, it does very much go back to education. Yeah, and I would just would love to say that there is the biggest misunderstanding of the Web3. So all of them, they are thinking that there's a one-time entrance, right? Just to create the collection, release the fund token, and grab the money or make the money. Web3, it's not like one-time entrance. It's a long path. Hmm. It's a strategy for 10, 20 years, something. It's forever. Yeah, it's forever to create the fund engagement and based on it, just increase your revenue streams in the future. Like Tim said, they will happen straight away. But you cannot just think, in, okay, just do it and make money, right? So I think that most of the sports I'm in the market, I mean, it took the wrong example because most of the fund tokens, they've been released when there was so much optimistic on the market. So the crypto, I mean, the fund tokens, they went 20x, 30x, 100x, whatever. Right now, most of them, they collapse for minus 70, 80%. Who hurts? Fans, the fans, right? The people who invest in, in this kind of digital collectibles. So you just start, you know, keep focus on the strategy, building, you know, the long path and just start thinking as a fun engagement, as a tool. Yeah. Because they've been not created for a revenue streams mostly, but to build the fun engagement. Because the new generation Z in the, in the future, most of them, they, they probably will look for, a, for a games using the mobile phones, right? So you have to attend them, come to games. So mm -hmm. create some NFT gating, tap the utility behind it, right? And then you have people on the game, right? If you will turn over for the monetization and if you can just turn over for the, I mean, the revenue streams, it's another, I mean, a, it's another benefit for the clubs. But I will say most of the clubs are supposed to think of it as a fun engagement tools, not a revenue, in revenue things, right? You've touched on fan engagement quite a bit. Is, is there demand from the fans, I guess, and maybe break it down, Mike, you can speak a little bit more about it. Um, in Europe and in Africa, I assume it's quite different. Um, what are fans looking for in Web3? Uh, most of the fans, of course, they will look for a money. I mean, how to, I mean, how to be close for the fans. I mean, we are trying to create the model of fun 24-7. So it doesn't matter wherever you're going to be, right? You will have, always have to, you always be, have the access to the club, right? So you can fo vote for some, I don't know, major, major things for the club, right? So you can be engaged. You can, I mean, uh, take something, buy something, and have uh, some kind of sense of ownership of your club. It means that you are trying to help to support, right? You can, I mean... Uh, take some, I don't know, exclusive concerts or take a part in some play to in games to make, to maybe to get some, I don't know, tokens which can be exchanged for, a, for a, I don't know, some rewards offered by the club, right? So here in Africa, I have no idea because the market does not exist, I mean, mm. so far based on the digital assets. I think that the first collections, same flag like Google did at the beginning 20 years ago when we have the bubble.com when the internet was created, giving everything to the people for free. Let them play. Let them play as much as they want. Once after they will be addicted to it, right? Then you can start thinking about making the revenue streams for the club. But our platform and our solutions offers the revenue stream for both sides. So the club and the fans, they can be engaged and make money on it. Hmm. And, and so far we've spoken exclusively about clubs as well. Um, Tim, maybe touch on, is this something that member associations should be thinking about as well? I mean, with their national teams, World Cup is coming up, obviously. Is it something that a member association can capitalize on? Do they need to think about it in terms of image rights with their players? Yeah, very much so. I mean, just going back to your, your question before, do, do fans care? I mean, it sounds strange coming from someone that represents football clubs and has a, a Web3 agency, but football fans don't care. The, min the majority is very, very small. And again, that goes back to how are you going to position this to your football fans? If you go in and you start saying, we're launching this NFT, we're doing this, we're doing that, 
the word NFT is, is, is not liked by football fans and actually by general consumers because I go back to people thinking it's either a, uh, an image or a monkey or a There's um, no difference, right? or a scam. Yeah, yeah there, there's, there's not a demand and there's not a need for it. So you need to create that demand by creating digital products. So I really do think that if we change that narrative, and again, it, it always goes back to education and understanding, and then how you talk to your your fans and talk to them why. It, it's amazing how many clubs we work with that do not want to talk to their fans. They don't want to say, we are doing this, and this is going to be the benefit from you. They're your fans. They support you. They love your team. They do everything. So speak to them like that and, and treat them like fans. Don't treat them like customers. But I think from a club perspective... Yeah, of course, it, it's very relevant for clubs. You will always have a fan base for clubs. But then when you look at a, a league level, you look at a federation level, it's equally important. Obviously, Top Shots and, and Dapper Labs ha, have done an amazing job with the likes of the NBA Top Shots, with obviously La Liga and everything that's going on with, with their new NFT drop around that. And I think they have a really good overview of the market because they are collecting those moments that people love it's the it's those goals it, it's the 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 things that really get us excited when we're watching sport the goals the 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 exciting moments but i think federations um governing bodies can can all look at it from from multiple multiple areas and we think about blockchain we think about nfts and, and again it's natural because of what we've we've seen in the mainstream press around revenue but actually it can be just a source of ownership a source of collection of data it can be with regards to your memberships um or sorry your player registrations how can then we issue an nft to each player and then that sits on the blockchain that cannot be altered, cannot be changed, and that can be a store of data. So federations could start issuing that. That can then fall into player transfer. That can fall into kind of sponsorship stuff. There, there's a whole range of it. So we, it, it's really amazing what blockchain technology will be able to do and the products that we can just build on top of that. And I think that's what we always have to remember. It's a product building on top of it. Mm. And how does that relate to a federation how does that relate to a governing body to a league to a club um, and it's then identifying who are you trying to do this and sell this to it might be a b2b business like yourself and then you're just saying to other clubs well look this is the nft and this is the store of data that cannot be altered cannot be changed and then and it's kind of sense of ownership as well, yeah, yeah sense of ownership and then when that player gets sold you can build into that nft that there's a smart contract that when that player gets sold, what have you, it goes back to the original academy. 2% of it goes back to the original academy for money. And then it goes to the first club and the second club. So it's kind of a distribution of wealth when a player gets sold. And then that there can be no argument because the NFT states that when that player gets sold, this academy gets this amount of money, what have you. So there, there's so many opportunities within the blockchain space, but it's identifying what that right product is. Yeah, yeah we've, we've spoken about it before. Um, from my perspective in the business that I'm in, um, Web3 is fascinating, as you say. I mean, we, so often you hear about it spoken in terms of transparency, and that's what, um, I mean, just... You know, with the the launch of the FIFA Clearinghouse just yesterday, um, that's what that's intended to to bring to the football international football transfer market is that sort of transparency with and with uh, Web3 and blockchain. If if all you know international player registrations or domestic player registrations are captured on the block, um, they can't be altered, they can't be changed, um, they can't be stolen, and then smart contracts could be used potentially to to trigger those training rewards or uh, FIFA put, solidarity payments as well. Yeah, when you put something on blockchain, it always stays on blockchain, so... Yeah. Right. Um, we spoke a little bit earlier, uh, just in the context of, of one of the event sponsors, um, Meta, the metaverse. Um, how does that factor potentially in Web3, and especially in football? I will call it, from my perspective, that uh, metaverse is some kind of like IKEA shop. Right? So all of the platforms and then the NFTs and everything what we are building for, it's uh, furniture what can be used. It's a real-time experience. It can be I mean, uh, used as a real-time experience. We, together with our technology partners, we are just you know, 
building and mixing the virtual reality with augmented reality. So it's a unique thing to build a fun engagement, even to watch the fans, the avatars, watch the game's lives, for the fans to make the doping, burn flares. I mean, uh, it's uh, possible to create a digital twin. So just for a simplicity, you can just duplicate your revenue streams by, I mean, uh, creating a digital stadium. You can sell, I mean, uh, sell the virtual seats, uh, virtual advisements, and this is a perfect tool to organize the fun engagement as well during the off-season, right? So you can organize the, the events. It can be, I mean, a tunnel for, uh, I mean, uh, some kind of malls, so even your business partners, they can create virtual shops, whatever. So it's totally unlimited, uh, unlimited options for, uh, for the whole market but it's never been so done so before. So we are trying, you know, together with our partners right now, we are trying to put a digital twin stadium here in Europe. Probably we will, I mean, add some little bit things with the museum so the people here on the stage, I mean, here in Durban, they will be able to connect without any gloves uh, to watch and visit the virtual museum as well. So it's like, I see there's a huge factor for it, yeah. the whole Web3. And also, I mean, we're all going to be watching the world. I think. So many people, for the past few weeks, um, wherever I go, I'm, I'm always asking people, do you realize that the World Cup is starting in just a, a few weeks or a few days' time now? Today's Thursday, it starts in four days, I guess, three days. Um, Algorand is a big sponsor now, of, has come on as, as a top-level sponsor at FIFA. We're all going to be seeing the name uh, over and over again for the next month on television. Tim, maybe speak a little bit. What is Algorand and why are they interested in football? Why are they a FIFA sponsor? So Algorand is a is a layer one blockchain, um, and and a blockchain obviously is essentially your your store of data. It's the same as Ethereum. There's there's many layer one blockchains, and it, it's it's a bit like in its simplest form, building on top of the the internet. It's like building an app in on top of uh, yeah on top of the internet, and it's obviously the store of data. It's a digital ledger, um, and obviously FIFA have partnered with Algorand to create a NFT drop. I know they've got other things in the works around um, store of data and, and how FIFA mm. want to really embed blockchain into, um, into their wider ecosystem and how that will benefit people like yourself and, and your company and other players and organizations all around the world. So from a consumer point of view, if unless you're a developer, unless you're a company looking to actually build on top of the blockchain, it probably won't have a huge amount of relevance to you. It will be the likes of crypto.com that you've seen, which is the exchange platform partner where you can then go and buy your cryptocurrency from that probably will have more of an effect. But I do think it's very insightful that we've got the biggest sporting tournament in the world, probably outside of the Olympics, um, happening and two of its key partners outside of Visa and Coca-Cola are a crypto exchange and, and a layer one blockchain. Um, so I think it really does signify the future of, of where this is going. But I'm sure we've all heard the news you've heard over the last kind of two weeks. You've had exchanges like FTX that have gone bust, went from a $24 billion company to zero in the matter of three days. So none of this helps the the whole market. Re the, the whole market, the reputation of the market, the, the image of cryptocurrency, of scams, of this, of that. So there really does need to be a change of, of mindset and, and these type of things don't help. But hopefully the World Cup will allow more people exposure to crypto. But again, we need to really look at the infrastructure and how does that relate to getting people in this room and getting federations and getting leagues and getting clubs and getting fans to start buying into the, the concept and understanding crypto and more importantly, simplifying it. It's too difficult at the moment and we need to make it easier. And that there's, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of rubbish in this space and people just need to be a lot more clearer. And if you are trying to not understand it, and you know your business inside out, and you're kind of like, mm, I don't quite get it. How is your fan base going to understand it? So we need to simplify that. And hopefully, with the World Cup, it will shine light on blockchains, the opportunity to build on top of blockchains. It will shine light on crypto.com to be able to purchase cryptocurrencies. But for me, I don't see it. I see it will be good brand exposure. But in terms of kind of user acquisition, 
I don't think it will do a huge amount. It's a part, it's a part of the adoption. Right now, just 4% of the people just using, I mean, uh, the, any crypto and the bl blockchain products, right? So uh, I think it's a part of the adoption. The adoption, the adoption will show over whenever the regular people who are on the stage, probably here on the, they will just start using the digital wallets. Then, mm -hmm. we have, we, then we are talking about the full adoption. So it's a part of it. So as a part of the adoptions, the, re the, the market has a you know, little bit mess sometimes, right? Some of the coins fall down, some of the exchanges, you know, I mean, they disappear on the market, yeah, but it's a part of it. So we have to just, like Tim said, just clarify it and make it like simplicity and just, you know, try to educate the people as simple as that. No. So it, you've touched on it. Looking down the road, um, and we'll circle back to putting this in an African perspective and context. Where do you see African clubs, African member association, African football benefiting from Web3 in five, ten years' time? You, you touched on it before. Web3 is forever. Um, where are we headed and how do we get there is it for the benefit of African football? Uh, from my perspective, when I've been in Africa 20, 26 years ago and I touched the real Africa, I see a lot of changes. And I, and I just got re uh, some, how to say, thoughts that American people, they are very good to create the unique ecosystems, right? In the past, they created the ecosystem with the three minutes. So whenever we w the clubs will, will give them the opportunity to create the ecosystem as a secondary market for a digital items, to build a fun engagement, etc., there is a perf perfect thing to, to share it with, you know, and just, you know, maybe even make money on it. So I think that is a has a huge, I mean, the perspectives for the African market in the, in the closest future. But as a start from beginning, they're supposed to take over the education first, right? Hmm. Just to keep focus, create the child of processing, and just follow the, follow the map. Otherwise, it's completely nonsense, but they have a, they have a chance because they are very beginning. So. Tim? I think the future is very exciting for, for African football and, and sports in general from a Web3 perspective. But I think we need to bring in multiple partners. I mean, I, I was listening to someone yesterday that was talking about kind of infrastructure and don't build infrastructure purely for the sake of building infrastructure. And I think it's, it's the case for Web3 as well. Like, you don't have to do it. You will, over time, I, I believe it will become more and more important. But you don't have to rush into this right now. You can take your time. Like, your fan base is always going to be there. You're not going to miss any crazy crazy opportunities if anything you're going to be able to learn and look at the market and see how it develops and and really understand it and then build it from there so i think from an african football perspective i think we really want clubs to understand that this is the future this can build a brand for you and i think one of the main things around football clubs like even outside of the web3 spaces you have an opportunity to build a brand you have your uh, you have your fan base that love you, that want to support you, that will do things. So the, you, wanna, you have a brand name. You, you, we all know the power of a logo, the power of a Man United logo, the power of an Arsenal logo. These logos of football clubs are unbelievably powerful and are recognized around the world. Um, but what a Web3 perspective can do in Africa is it can start connecting you with different communities. It can open up the door to you then creating partnerships with other Web3 projects around around the world. There's a club in, in the UK called, um, called Bromley. Um, and Bromley did a, a partnership as, well, they got taken over by a company called Wagme United. And they basically created their club now all based on Web3. So fans can vote on what positions they want to do, this and that. And then they partnered with a Web3, with an NFT project out of the States. And this, Im it's an image, it's a squiggle. Anyway, they did, they did a partnership with that and they did their first NFT launch and they raised like $3 million in three minutes. And this is a club that have like a stadium of, I think it's 6,000 people or 12,000 people, apologies if I don't know the right number, but it's a small club, it's a second tier club, it's an old historic English football club, but it's not a Premier League club, it doesn't have a global fan base, it is a small community driven football club. Mm. And they then brought NFTs into it and Web3 into it. And, and they are now a brand. And they've now created a, a kind of crypto community. And then their fans are seeing this revenue coming in that is benefiting it. Um, and there was a bit of kickback around it. And this is the opportunity for clubs in here. I'm not saying that every club in this room that's listening to this is going to make $3 million in three minutes or anything like this. But it allows you to create this new way and connect with people across the internet. But 
we also then need to look at how do we simplify that? And, and again, listening to um, the, I think, telecoming um, presentation. Patricia. Yeah. Talking, looking at how do you then bring in those partners? How do you start using it? How do you bring it into the apps? How do you make it easy for your fans that actually your fans don't even realize that this is kind of a Web3 product? That they this don't is, care about it. No. It has to work just. Yeah, it needs to be very easy. It needs to be very exactly. simple for you. And, and you're buying this product. Like, why are you doing it? What are the benefits that you get from it? You buy a ticket, then you get a real life ticket to go to the game. But then when you come back onto the platform, your ticket is updated and it's got the score and it's got the man of the match and then it's got some content on there. And that then goes as a, as a collectible. So rather than you leaving it in your jacket or forgetting it in a restaurant after the game, what have you, you have a place to go. And, and what we do at Capital Block is we implement not only all of that strategy, the marketing, all everything that's needed to do this, we then implement the the tech that sits on your website. You won't ever hear about Capital Block because we're just behind the scenes making you see it. It has to be a club facing project and a club facing product because your fans are going to listen to you as a club or a league or a federation far more than they're ever going to listen to me at Capital Block. So we will help support you on that, but you can drive this and then you can have the opportunity to create whatever you want to do, but then talk to your fans. So I think it's very, very exciting. I think, uh, as Mike said, we're at the beginning here and it's not been done. And I think we are... It can be done well, I mean. But it can be done very well. And so I think we bring in the right partners, we work together, we can really drive not only Web3 adoption, but also the the viewership, the the data resources, the the whole of African football. I think it can be developed from this. It can get more eyeballs onto the, the industry, identifying new players, better players. So it can drive it as a whole. It shouldn't just be focused around be, what you yeah. sell. It can be even done better than Europe. Hmm. Because Euro people, Euro clubs, they have bad habits, right? Here I just said since last two days, I see people who, who love to listen, who would love to learn a little, little bit more about the, about the Web3, right? Most of the clubs, when we are just calling them to a side appointment for the sports metaverse, for the digital world, hey, we I don't have a time, we just, you know, fire the coach, etc. Here is not. So I think that it can be done a little bit much more better than in Europe, starting from the very beginning. Quickly, before we're out of time, remind me the name of the club that uh, was purchased by the, the, the crypto bros? In Bromley. Bromley. Can you just speak briefly about the, that use case? Is there a DAO involved there? So I believe there is. I mean, a DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization, and it is being spoken a lot. And essentially, everyone has voting rights, and then it's all very equal, and then you can make decisions in the club and stuff I like that. I almost think of it as a WhatsApp group that owns a football club. Yeah. Uh, the problem with a DAO at the moment, and it's still got a long way to go, is it depends on how many tokens you hold, the power of your voting influence and stuff like that. And then ultimately, the DAO is owned by someone. And that is a three, four, five, however many people. So um, it's still got a long way to go down. But a DAO is a whole nother conversation. That, next time. That, yeah, for next time. <laughs> okay, great. I see our time's up, guys. Um, but I want to thank everyone. Um, I just want to say you know, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that I'm sitting here with a, the, the panel today is a, a Polish technologist, a British technologist, an American technologist here sitting about and talking about African football. And I just want to say what a privilege it is to sit here and, and speak about African football, uh, how much we enjoy it. And um, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Mike. Really well, appreciate your, your insights. Uh, a huge learning journey for us, I think, on that last panel. Um, and again, I think it's something that we're going to just see come more and more in, in the years to come. I think that you know, tech has its influence on everything that we do. If you think about just how our lives function now compared to, say, 15 years ago, in terms of you know, what many of you are using right now, your mobile phone or your laptop, everything has been necessarily changed definitively by tech and Web3 is just the latest version and chapter of that. And I think there was amazing insights from the panel there in that last, in that last session. Um, although I think that one of the things I, I like that Tim highlighted was about the language here. We've got to be trying to be inclusive with this and trying to attract people to investigate this world for themselves. Just simply the, the, the word, the, the abbreviation NFT, 
isn't liked by football fans or general consumers. There's not a demand or a need for it. And also, there's just not an understanding of exactly what it is. You have to create that demand by creating digital products. That should be the focus, less what it's called. And the challenge is education. I think that is absolutely right. Building the right infrastructure, making it accessible to people. You've got to really simplify it and make it understandable. Just talk plain English. That's about digital products and selling it in that same way. And the tech follows. And uh, Mike's saying that you know this is this is a long-term plan. You've got to be in this for the long haul. You know, everyone believes there's a a one-time entrance for Web3. Come in, release fan tokens, make money, and leave. Well, I mean, nothing short-term necessarily checks out that way, or indeed is good for your long-term strategy. This is not true. It is forever a strategy for 10 to 20 years to engage your fans. It needs that kind of commitment. And I guess it's, I suppose, how you consider it as fan engagement first and revenue generating afterwards. And I'm sure that it will. If you manage to engage your fans in the right way, then you, they will want to spend money with you and on your brand.